Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Friends, the Lord is coming soon. Are you ready? Join us now for the Midnight Cry broadcast. I'm just going to go ahead by faith and, and share thoughts that I've had. And of course, one of the main reasons that, that would cause me to, to hold back a little bit is when I see my own, when I look in the mirror and <laughs> see my own need. But the truth is, I, I, I'm discovering more and more that every time I go through something that reminds me of how much, I, how much my need is, how great my need is, the Lord reminds me, He said, you're not the only one. And, you know, when the Lord uses people, He doesn't use perfect people. You know, they may be a little further along in some respects, but, you know, we, we talked last week about God using us. And I'll bet you that uh, just about everybody here at one time or another has thought, who, me? How could the Lord use somebody like me? Look at me, look at what happened. And, you know, the devil jumped on you and pulled on your weaknesses. And, you know, okay, we'll just settle back, let somebody else do whatever. That's kind of how we tend to think. And we've got a devil. And we know that because of the victory that was won at the cross, he really doesn't have any weapons except lies. All he, do, all he can do is lie and appeal to our human nature since we're still living in these bodies. That's about what he's got going for him. And the problem is we listen to him too much. And we've got so much we, the Lord wants, us to teach, wants to teach us and help us to learn. And, uh, you know, my thoughts came from the book of Colossians, certainly one of my favorite books, one of the deepest in the Scriptures. And it seems like every time I think about ministering from this book, I'm, I'm almost overwhelmed because what do you leave out? And yet you don't want to sit there and go on for hours uh, trying to expound every little thing. We want to, we want to have the, the Lord's thoughts and the Lord's focus. But the, the letter to the Colossians was written, as we know, when Paul was in prison, and he had been in prison for years. So this wasn't somebody sitting in an ivory tower somewhere spouting out theology. This was somebody who had been in the trenches experience things that you and I may never experience, at least to, a, to that depth, although God knows <laughs> the world we're living in. But anyway, he was in prison, and he had heard of a church that had been founded by a brother that he knew, and, uh, but he had never been to this place, to Colossae. But the report had come back to him from somebody that was associated with Paul and his ministry, and you know, in effect, God, Paul's ministry was just going right on, even though he was in prison. There were people that he had trained and sent out, and they were going out, and the word, the word was going out, and he was rejoicing in what was going on. But he felt a desire and a need to take use of his time and to write to them, to encourage them. And so he writes, uh, rejoicing in their hope. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick just parts of this because I want to get to something uh, as we go on. But what was his purpose in writing? He begins to expound that in verse 9 of chapter 1. He says, for this reason, and the reason being that he had been informed of their faith, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. That's important, isn't it? You know, we see that, that theme of prayer throughout the Scriptures. God works in concert with prayer. And that gives us a part and a place to pray, to, to do, uh, to, to cooperate and to be a part of what God's doing. And Paul knew, of course, yes, I can write to them, but I can do something right now that's going to cause life to be infused in that church. I can sit here in a Roman prison and make a difference in people hundreds of miles away. And you know, the truth is that we can. I've had that sense many times. I've, I've been praying, I'm no doubt many of you have too, that we're praying for somebody overseas like when Brother Kumar was, was down with, and, and really the doctors were, weren't giving a lot of hope there recently with COVID. And I had this sense that, Lord, it's just like I'm standing right next to him. I have every right to stand here and put my, by faith, put my hands on him and pray. Am I the only one? No, I know there's others that experience that. And, uh, you know, that's the, that's the wonderful thing about being one with the Lord. We're, he's everywhere, and in a sense, we are just by participating with him. 
and we can actually make a difference. So anyway, Paul was certainly making that difference. But what was he praying? He's saying, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. You know, there's a lot right there. And, uh, you know, it kind of reminds you of what he wrote about the Ephesians, about knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And just to refresh our minds, the knowledge is, uh, answers the question, what? What does God want? What do, we, what do we need to know? Because we're living in a world that is founded upon lies, that operates by lies. And my God, we need to know the truth. So we need to hear what God says, but notice how he, what he sticks at the end of that. It's as the Spirit gives. We need knowledge that comes directly from God and from a relationship with Him. This is not secondhand knowledge. You can't have somebody tell you all about what it is and say, oh yeah, I believe that because so-and-so said so. So-and-so may say so, but, if God, but God needs to be in that in such a way that you have a personal encounter in your heart with God and the conviction is formed there, not because someone says so, but because God says so. There's knowledge that we need. And there's knowledge. Do you believe there's knowledge God wants to impart to you that you don't have right now? There better be, because there's a lot of stuff I don't know. And I have a feeling going forward, I'm going to need to know it. You know, I thought of a, uh, a somewhat humorous example of, of, that, that illustrates our state in, in more ways than we might like to admit. And I've told this story before, but you know, during our first trip to, the, to uh, India, Jim and I went to a lot of places. And I remember that last weekend, we traveled down to the coast where the tsunami had just hit a few months before. So this was 05 in the spring, and, or in the fall, rather. And the tsunami had just had hit that previous December. And I remember walking out on the beach and, and looking at this flat area everywhere and seeing people who lived in huts that reminded me of Native American dwellings, except they were built with bamboo and, and some kind of covering. You know, their church building was just basically something you'd have to duck to get into, and then you're just standing in a stick building with tarp over it. And I'm wondering, how in the world can these people, could these people have survived you know, a huge wave coming in on that flat area? But somehow the Lord brought them through. But there, was, there were many groups that we visited, a number of them, in that region, and one of them was very interesting. We drove out onto a river delta that went on and on and on. You know, a lot of times when a river ends, you got swampland, you got all kinds of territory. There were fish farms out there with, where they'd blocked off saltwater ponds and people doing all kinds of things. Well, anyway, Brother Kumar took us out to a place and to a, a little church building, and he began to tell us the story about these people. Now, one thing about the people in India, they are very tribal. They tend to have grown up with family groups, and many of them have their own languages, and they also have their own particular, uh, well, there's a warning, I guess it's God, <laughs> praise God. But anyway, they'll have their own particular uh, way of earning a living. Some will, will fa fish farm, some will grow this or raise that and so forth. Well, this particular group had a trade that had evolved in their family group. And their trade was they killed for a profit. They're, they're, I mean, they were contract killers. That, are you supposed to laugh? No. No, I mean, literally, that was their trade. If somebody wanted somebody killed, they had a feud going on, some other neighbor, neighboring family or tribe, say, I know how to deal with this. We'll pay so and such a tribe and they'll take care of it. And they were skilled killers. Well, the, the gospel began to penetrate that group, and, the, and God began to save people. And, you know, the time came when, when it was, seemed like a, the right thing to do to build a church. And, of course, you have a certain amount of cost, even though the church buildings were simple. And so they came down, and the people were all excited about the project. And, and uh, so they're, they're trying to think of the cost and say, now, how many contracts is that going to take? <laughs> And so they had to be informed. Uh, it's not quite how it works, guys. Uh, <laughs> that's not God's will. God's called you out of that. But do you see the principle there of ig spiritual ignorance? 
and the need for knowledge of what God wants and, God, and God's will. But one thing I see that, that blessed me greatly is I didn't see the Lord saying, well, I'm going to wash my hands of those stupid people. I mean, those crazy people. And uh, he, he understood exactly what he was getting into, and he knew right where they were, and he loved them anyway. And he just, you know, they were ignorant. They didn't know. And so he, he taught them some more and taught them. And, you know, isn't that the way it is with us? I'll bet that there are areas of our lives, no matter how long we've known the Lord, where we are just as ignorant as those folks. We need the Lord, folks. And, uh, you know, in process of time, just to finish the story, the Lord did direct them into a different line of work. <laughs> they began to raise prawns, uh, which are a seafood delicacy. They were very, became very prosperous at it. They used some of these fish farm areas out on the Delta there, and so their whole way of life got changed. It wasn't just that they, uh, you know, came to the Lord and went on being whatever. But anyway, isn't the Lord good? But you see what Paul is, is dealing with here. That's one of the things that we've got, to, we've got to advance in. There's stuff that we just don't know. Or we think we know. And God has to straighten us out. And I... And I the more I go, the more I have to say, well, I just don't know about that. I don't know about this. I don't have an answer to this. I remember somebody one time, and I probably mentioned this before, at a convention was visiting from another area, and we were visiting in Jimmy Robbins' home, and he asked me about a, 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 a scripture in Revelation. What does this mean? And he was expecting some erudite answer. I, said, I basically said, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> but you know, we need to be willing, if we don't have a clue, to say, I've got, I don't have a clue. God's not holding, us, holding that against us. We don't have to pretend that we know something we don't. We just say, Lord, you know. My trust is in you, not in having all the answers. Praise God. But God does want to give us knowledge if we're willing that we don't possess now. And Paul knew that. So that answers the question of what. But it isn't just knowledge. There has to be wisdom and understanding. Understanding answers the question why. Why are things the way they are? Is there anybody here who hasn't asked a why question in the last week? Why am I like this? Why, why can't I overcome this? Why is this circumstance that way? I mean, God wants to give us understanding of the why because we're prone to just go by what we think we know, what we've learned and what people have taught us instead of saying, Lord, I want to understand, I want to see this through your eyes so that I can know why things are the way they are. Because if I do understand the why, I can, I can have a peace about things that right now I'm struggling with. And the reality is we know that God has allowed us to live in a world of adversity in bodies that don't like him at all and don't want to serve him. And he's done it with a loving purpose that goes into eternity. And he understands what's going on, and he longs to share greater and greater degrees of understanding with us. Anybody here need greater understanding? Yeah, God wants us to understand things. The message you have heard is part of a regular church service recorded as it was being ministered. CD and DVD copies of this service in its entirety are available. To assist with postage and processing costs, an offering of $5 is suggested for CDs and $10 for DVDs. Please identify the station over which you have heard this broadcast and provide the broadcast date when ordering. You may also receive our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, which is mailed out free and postage paid to all who request it. Our mailing address is Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box, 685 Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. Or you may choose to visit us on the World Wide Web at www.midnightcry.org. And now, may God richly bless you until our next broadcast. <laughs>